All right, I think we'll get started and um, more people will join, I'm sure. Thanks for, for joining us for, for that new mention now. Um, today, uh, we have a pretty interesting topic. I, uh, and looking at the registry, it seems like it's a hot topic for a lot of people, and that's great. Um, we have two speakers today, Tiffany and Kiran. Uh, they will uh, take us through a, a tour about HPE sustain sustainability strategy and sustainability research at HP. And um, before I hand over to uh, Tiffany, I'd like to remind you a couple of housekeeping uh, items for the HP developer community. My name is Didier, I'm the tech lead for that community. And I would like to remind you that we have two different programs, uh, technology talks, we call them meetups and munch and learn. This one is part of the munch and learn series. Both of these series are monthly. And uh, we try uh, in the Munch and Learn to get something around thought leadership, vendor agnostics, trends in the industry. And, um, and uh, you can find our calendar page with all the previous talks and the replay links if you missed it. Also, you will see that we don't have a session for November yet. Uh, I'm working on it. Uh, we have a working title for something on low code, no code, and citizen dev. Um, more in the coming days and the uh, registration link should come up uh, pretty quickly. Uh, for the meetups, it's a little different. We started the meetups uh, in January this year. And uh, these are more in-depth, more product focus and open source developer and more. We have a, a bunch already in the pipe uh, for October, November and two in December. So for October, we have something from um, um, an Esmeral partner called Paper Data, uh, talking about boosting AI workload with Spark. And um, in November, we have uh, an introductory uh, talk on Kubeflow uh, delivered by a, a company called Arikto. And in December, we are working with a speaker from Google Cloud to uh, uh, to do a two series session on two part session on uh, running reliable systems. Part one will be about uh, SRE, an overview, and then uh, in the second session, one week later, we'll do an SLO math, which is uh, the next step to uh, building an SRE. So if you are into uh, this kind of uh, thinking and uh, trying to implement some sort of SRE, this is probably something you'd like to, uh, to attend. We also do a number of other things at the uh, developer community uh, available to everyone external and internally. We do workshops on demand and these are uh, workshops, uh, Jupyter based, Jupyter notebook based workshop available 24 by seven and for free over the internet. Uh, we maintain that platform. We have right now 29 workshops in our catalog, including a lot of open source topics, uh, languages, uh, things on Kubernetes, Docker, all sorts of things. Uh, give it a try. If you do try it, give us pro, uh, feedback. We have a survey at the end that help us build uh, more content for, for that. Um, and because this is a community we are trying to <laughs> build here and drive, uh, we need you to amplify and contribute. Uh, community doesn't work without the people inside the community. So join us and invite others to uh, join our talks uh, like we have today, a very good crowd. Um, invite others to join our monthly newsletter. This is a newsletter we send at the beginning of every month to keep up with some of the things we uh, deliver for developer data scientists. And uh, you can always unsubscribe if you don't like it. And uh, we have a Slack, a dedicated Slack, uh, where you can escalate and ask questions, uh, dev questions on our different uh, product platforms, open source projects. We also have a Twitter account. I'm not really a Twitter guy, but if you are, uh, we have a, a huge handle there. And um, one thing that we are looking at always is uh, blog writers. So if you feel like you're an S SME for a particular uh, topic that you'd like to share with us, um, reach out to us. We have a, a website, a web page that explains uh, how we can, how you can contribute blogs. We use Markdown, we use GitHub, all of which should be familiar to you. Um, and we also accept, of course, people for delivering more. So meetups, for example, and workshops on demand. So if this is something you'd like to uh, work with us on, uh, please reach out to us. 
And with that, I would like to remind you that we have a website, which uh, I think Denis in the background has dumped all the links for you, so you don't have to remember. Otherwise, we have a, a QR code you can scan that will take you to the community page on our website. But remember, developer.hp.com, that's more or less where everything starts for us. And this said, I'm gonna hand it over to Tiffany for the real content of that session. All right. So it's good to be here this morning. Thanks for extending the invitation. Uh, my name is Tiffany Jarnigan, and I am Director of Sustainability, Innovation, and Partnerships. I sit within the Living Progress team, which is in corporate affairs at HPE. And I just want to do a quick check. Everybody can see my screen okay? Yes, we do. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, Colin, would you like to introduce your, yourself real quick, and then I'll take it away? Sure, and I just I'm Cullen Bash. I'm a, 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 a director of systems architecture within Hewlett Packard Labs. And like Tiffany, just wanted to extend my uh, thanks for being here today. I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, discussion. And um, I, I lead systems architecture, but but my background is in sustainability as as well. I've been doing research in sustainability for quite some time, and so Tiffany and I uh, work together on uh, several pan HPE initiatives around sustainability. So again, looking forward to this discussion. Great. So what we're planning to take you through this morning is a bit about HPE's sustainability strategy uh, writ large. I'll give you sort of a signal of the bigger picture and then we'll narrow down to really what's happening around products and innovations at HPE. And then we will launch into some of the exciting R&D initiatives underway at Hewlett Packard Labs and at HPE. And then we'll take a little bit of a deep dive into a proof of concept that I've been working on with a broader team, uh, including the office of the CTO. And then we'll wrap it up with some questions and answers. So HPE sustainability strategy. We, as a team, um, we focus on purpose-driven ESG initiatives and we align them with HPE's business strategy. So the integration of these ESG, which stands for environmental, social, and governance issues into our business strategy really increases the competitiveness and the resilience of our business and differentiates us in the marketplace. So we focus on key ESG issues with the most significant impact on our business as a technology provider and on the planet and society. So you can see those in those three pillars here. So we have accelerating net zero, investing in people and operating with integrity. So for the purposes of this, con uh, for this conversation and presentation, we're gonna be focusing on net zero and how HPE is conducting research and building products to really drive a net zero future for our customers. So we get a lot of questions all the time around <laughs> what is net zero? Are all net zero claims the same? What does this really mean? So in succinct terms, net zero is a state where the amount of greenhouse gas emissions produced by human activity are completely negated by reducing emissions and implementing methods of absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the net in net zero is important because it's virtually impossible to reduce all emissions um, on the time scale that are needed. So you can see right here, according to climate science, we're really trying to get to this spot where we hit net zero by 2050. Through avoided emissions, which is this gray box, this is about where we can get by 2050. So the remaining emissions are what need to be taken care of with essentially carbon removal approaches. So in order to, and it's a very complex topic, as you might imagine. So in order to simplify the multitude of terms and the inconsistency in net zero commitments, last year, the science-based target initiative, which is essentially the gold standard for climate targets, launched the first framework for corporate net zero target setting, which includes guidance on the criteria companies need to meet their targets and to ensure that they're in line with limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so last year we went through the process of not only going through the approval for the SBTI uh, approval of our targets to hit net zero by 2040, but we also accelerated our timeline. So last year we had set a 2050 target and then this year we decided that in order to really show up as a business in the way that we need to, that we needed to accelerate that timeline by about 10 years. So 
Really, the issue is lowering the energy and resource consumption of IT solutions, uh, which is critical to meeting increased expectations from customers, adhering to stringent market access requirements, and ensuring the long-term viability of our business. So our approach, HPE, is now committed as of this past spring to becoming a net zero enterprise by 2040, um, and that is an SBTI-approved goal. So what does that actually break down to mean uh, when we talk about a net zero commitment and reaching that by 2040? So without going into all of the nuances of carbon accounting, uh, scope one and scope two is basically your operational emissions. So it's either the energy that you generate or through owned assets like a car or a generator, or it's purchased electricity. So our baseline for scope one and scope two, we're planning to reduce 70% against that baseline by 2030 and then 90% by 2040. Scope three, which you can see in orders of magnitude is quite large compared to our scopes one and two. That you can, you can say that that's mostly upstream and downstream. There are 15 different categories of emissions that go into that. And so for us, in order to reach net zero, we, Okay, sorry, just seeing some things coming in through the chat. Uh, is that better? Can you guys not see that bar anymore? Okay, so in order, awesome. <laughs> in order for us to hit net zero by 2040, that means that we need to reduce our target or we need to target to reduce by 42% of our scope three emissions by 2030 and then 90% by 2040, which is pretty audacious. This also includes us setting a target to hit 100% renewable energy by 2030 and 80% of our suppliers to have science-based targets. So when we break down what our footprint actually looks like, um, you can see, like I said, there's basically what we're doing in our operations and then there's sort of everything upstream and everything downstream. And the way that that breaks down for us um, as a, hardware manufacturer and a service provider is that about 31% of those emissions are in our supply chain. So that's the emissions associated with the manufacturing of our products and solutions. You can see that 66% is in the products and solutions themselves in the use phase. So what that means is because we sell products that use electricity, um, those are the emissions associated with the electricity during the entire life of that product. And so for us, it becomes pretty clear where the opportunities for us to reduce impact are. So we've got through our product design and thinking about how we can reduce that embedded portion of our carbon emissions. And then we've got everything in the product use phase. So how can we drive more efficiencies and make sure that our product is optimized to use as much energy is required to do the most amount of work possible. And so 25% um, of our production suppliers by spend have scope one and two science-based targets. And emission, we have an emissions management platform which is available to about 80% of our suppliers by spend. Now on the products and solutions side, which is really where we're gonna spend the rest of this presentation focusing, we do an analysis to understand sort of what percentage of our products are considered sustainable IT. And to date, that's about 50%, but we have plans to continue the rigor and increase the accuracy of this assessment and continue to drive that percentage up so that we can make sure that we're delivering the most efficient and um, sustainable products to our customers as possible. We also have figured out that just by switching to a service as a service model, like through HPE GreenLake, um, because of the innate configurations and optimizations that occur by having this managed service, customers are able to reduce inefficiencies by 30%. And in some cases, we've seen customers reduce up to 70%. And then, of course, one of the things that's most interesting about HPE and the, and the breadth of services and products that we can offer to our customers, we also have HPE Financial Services, which runs two very large technology renewal centers that are responsible for processing about 3 million assets per year. And that's not just HPE assets, but other companies as well. 
And <clears throat> one of the other things that we do that's unique to our sustainability team that not all sustainability teams that other companies have is we have a customer facing arm of our team that helps our customers understand how to use our products in the most sustainable way possible. So it's really like a partnership approach and the wins in net revenue attributed to these customer engagements reached about 891 million last year. And so now I'm gonna kick it off to Cullen, who's gonna take us through some of the research and some of the products that we've been working on over the years um, that really demonstrate how you can bring sustainability to life in products. So all right, thank, thank you, Tiffany. Away. Am I coming through? Can you all hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I'll take that as a yes. All right, good. Um, you know, so I, I think if anything, you know, from you know, Tiffany's introduction, what we can gain from that is getting to net zero is not going to be easy. You know, we've made some pledges ourselves as a company and our customers are also making pledges and to help them improve energy efficiency, reduce carbon footprint, it, it's going to take um, focus across our entire technology stack. So it's it's not just one solution that magically will uh, will help us get to net zero. So what you're going to hear about today and kind of this next part portion of the section is um, kind of an overview of a broad cross section of things that we're doing within research that could potentially get pulled into our product portfolio uh, that that will will help us uh, take down some of those. Um, those emissions numbers uh, for ourselves and for our customers that um, that Tiffany was showing. So before I get into to some of the things uh, that we're doing from an R&D perspective, wanna give you a kind of an overview of, of Hewlett Packard Labs in case uh, you're not familiar with it. So, uh, and you'll hear me say labs, Hewlett Packard Labs, it means the same thing, but it's the central research organization for, for the company. Um, we are not the primary R&D organization. R&D is dispersed throughout our business groups uh, across the entire company. Uh, and so we work with them, but we tend to be focused more on applied and exploratory research that's roughly in this chart here, you know, two to 10 years out in, into the future, five plus years to, to 10 years into the future. And our, our aim is to develop opportunities for the company, ideally disruptive opportunities for the company uh, that will help drive future business. And, but then uh, other than just developing these opportunities, um, a lot of our focus is to de-risk uh, technology. So if we, if we have an idea, if we think something might be important, uh, then we spend a lot of time de-risking it before we then transfer it over to our business units and work with them on, uh, on commercialization. So we overlap with our business unit R&D organization, sort of in that advanced development uh, middle area uh, where we work together to transfer technology and then um, ultimately, hopefully commercialize it. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, um, so this figure describes the areas of, of focus then for, for Hewlett Packard Labs. And I'll, I'll just give a kind of a quick overview at, at the top is uh, silicon enablement. And so for here, we're developing technologies that enable uh, differentiation in silicon. Uh, for AI and quantum, uh, that group is investigating uh, trustworthy AI solutions that extend from hardware all the way up into, into software. So they're looking at kind of uh, you know, that whole stack. Uh, and then also uh, with a, a focus that's that's just starting up on uh, on quantum computing and, and how we can uh, help advance uh, that area um, for our customers. Network and distributed systems is is really about optimizing uh, the network and then the, the distributed resources that are attached to that network. Uh, photonics and fabrics uh, on the um, lower um, portion now creates uh, optical interconnect solutions and then optical computing technology. So here we're looking at photonics, not just for communication, but also for computing. Can we build hardware accelerators that do computation in the photonics domain uh, rather than in the electronic domain? And then future system architecture, that's the group that I lead. And here we're looking at uh, how to advance architecture for, um, for future workloads that our customers might be interested in. I'll go through some of this uh, toward, uh, toward the end on what we're doing in that space. And then security and sustainability to kind of round it out um, spans all of those focus areas. So like I said, sustainability to use that as an example, but security too, isn't just focused on one part of the technology stack. It needs to look at the whole thing in order to have uh, the biggest impact. And then the outcome of this work 
you know, ideally is targeted at developing commercial products, um, but it, it's not limited to that. We're also looking at influencing our suppliers, uh, influencing the open source community, um, driving business value through IP licensing, um, through um, incubations uh, where appropriate, and even um, spin outs. And so we've taken some companies outside of HP or HPE uh, to, um, to continue that work and, uh, and continue uh, commercialization outside of the umbrella of the larger company. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, and so when we think about sustainability, um, we think about it in two broad categories. And the first is sustainable IT. So how do we, how do we use uh, IT or how do we improve the sustainability of our own products or how do we develop services to help customers with uh, improving their sustainability portfolio? So that's sort of that top bar. And then uh, we also think about it in terms of how we might use IT or digital technology to improve the sustainability of, of, of adjacent ecosystems. And, and so on the top, I'm gonna to go through some examples of what we're doing in the system space, in, uh, in photonics, in facilities and data centers. I'll give you a couple of, of, uh, of, um, of overviews for each. And then at the bottom, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some work we're doing to, um, to help accelerate the decarbonization of the energy grid with a partner uh, called Carnegie Clean Energy in Australia that makes wave energy converters. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, this one, we've been showing this slide for, for a while and it motivates, we adjusted it over time, but it motivates a lot of our R&D efforts. And, um, and what you're looking at below that purple graph is Moore's Law scaling. And it's ending in about 2025. And at the same time, uh, data is exploding. And that's the, the cyan curve. And it's been exploding exponentially now for, for some time. And compute is, is simply not keeping up with data. Advances in compute because of the slowdown in Moore's law is not keeping up with this data explosion. But it's not just about the data anymore. Uh, along with data, applications are being developed uh, that are placing additional strain on compute. And this is resulting in a growing capability gap between compute, between data growth, and between the needs of applications. So we need to rethink compute to be able to keep up and, and start closing this gap. Um, but it's not just about performance, right? We, we have to rethink compute in a way that also preserves efficiency. If we don't do that, then um, we're gonna be continually moving away from that sustainability curve and, uh, and not able to meet uh, the goals that, that Tiffany articulated. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right. And Although Moore's law is ending, and this is sort of the, uh, the unfortunate uh, truth of things, power consumption continues to increase in CPUs and accelerators. And, and the reason that's happening is because, because Moore's law is, is sort of tapering off, um, uh, suppliers, CPU suppliers, GPU suppliers are putting more and more dye together in, um, in multi-chip modules. And so that's increasing power while overall performance is, is, uh, is also increasing. And it, in the past, you know, th this is not an entirely new thing, uh, but in the past, this increase in power consumption was mitigated by improvements in, in IC packaging. So IC packaging, if you're not familiar, those are the packages that house the silicon and, um, and uh, the, the efficiency by which heat is removed from that package is a function of the package design. And so what we wanna try and do is keep the silicon temperature below a certain amount. And to do that, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can do things like change the uh, certain characteristics of that package to improve efficiency, but uh, largely those efficiency improvements have, have tapered off over time. And so uh, what suppliers are doing now is reducing case temperature limits. The case temperature is the top of the IC packages where the heat sink meets the case and removes the, uh, the heat from that IC package. So they use case temperature as a proxy for silicon temperature. If silicon temperature gets too high, then things start to fail, the reliability of the system goes down. So they specify that case temperature. So that's challenging. We have power going up, we have case temperature going down, making thermal design in systems and our ability to remove that heat efficient, efficiently more challenging. Um, but to make things even more interesting, um, facility chilled water has been rising uh, fairly steadily in order to improve energy efficiency so that facility providers uh, use less energy and spend less on energy. So 
that that temperature, that chilled water supply temperature is what we call it, has been increasing from 25 to 27 to 32 degrees C to in some cases even 40, 40 degrees C, which is about 104 Fahrenheit. Um, so all of those factors combine to make systems more challenging to cool. And so one way to improve efficiency is to bring facility chilled water closer to those sources of heat uh, and uh, as close to the internal uh, uh, inside of the system as we can possibly get it. So let's go to the next slide. All right, and, and so this is an example of one such system that's bringing liquid into the system. Uh, this is the Cray, uh, 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 the HPE Cray EX4000. So this is an exascale class supercomputer when scaled out. It's 100% liquid cooled. So all the CPUs, all the GPUs, all the memory DIMMs are all cooled with liquid. There's no air moving through this system at all. So it's pretty unique. Um, and when fully configured, the system includes eight racks uh, that are cooled by a closed loop uh, coolant distribution unit. So that, that CDU, that coolant distribution unit is what's on the right-hand side in white. And what that does is it pumps uh, a, a fluid, a, a liquid, it's not chilled water, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's water with some solutions uh, attached to it that, that make it more suited for uh, cooling electronics. But that, that pumps the fluid around all of those, uh, those racks and through all the systems. And then there's a, um, a heat exchanger within that coolant distribution unit that, that transfers heat to the facility's uh, chilled water system where it's then taken outside of, of the data center and, and it's exhausted. Um, the system is comprised of a combination of CPUs and GPUs. The trays on the right are uh, just some examples of, um, of, of these CPU, GPU uh, uh, trays. 256 of those trays uh, can uh, can make up the the, uh, the the kind of the scaled out system, and the power dissipation once this is scaled out on a per rack basis. Here you're looking at two racks per cabinet. So that ca those cabinet doors that are open uh, within those within that one cabinet are two racks. Each rack can consume 200 kilowatts of power, and then aggregated across those eight racks, total would be 1.6 megawatts. So it's an incredibly dense uh, system, um, but because it's entirely liquid cooled, it captures all of that generated waste heat into the chilled water system, and it can accommodate chilled water at temperatures of up to 40 degrees C. So it doesn't require mechanical chillers within the facility. Once we can get chilled water temperature up to that high, it means that largely we can remove mechanical refrigeration, which significantly improves energy efficiency of uh, the overall cooling system. So this is an extreme example, but it represents uh, the most efficient method we have today for cooling our, uh, our systems. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Those are some really good questions coming up and I can't answer all of them right now. So keep them coming and we'll, we'll come back to them. Um, all right, so if we expand this EX4000 cluster to 74 cabinets, I showed you four cabinets in that previous one. Now 74 cabinets, we can get to exascale performance, which is what we've done with Frontier, uh, the Frontier system in partnership with AMD and Oak Ridge National Lab. And by the way, today is October 19th. Yesterday was October 18th, which is National Exascale Day. 10 to the 18. So happy post exascale day for everyone. I, I know we, uh, we had uh, quite a bit of celebrating around uh, HPE. Um, but the system specs uh, are pretty remarkable. I won't go through them all on, on the right, but uh, you know, almost 38,000 GPUs, 94,072 CPUs, um, 75,000 plus DIMMs. Uh, at uh, maximum uh, power consumption, it's 29 megawatts, 29 megawatts. Uh, and uh, we, we achieved 1.1 exaflops uh, in March of 2022. So it, it's number one on the top 500 list of supercomputers today. But I think more impressive, more remarkable is uh, that the system is also the most performant efficient in the world. Again, it's not about just raw performance. It's about getting that performance in as efficient a manner as possible. And so we top the green 500 list in the, in the top two spots. The first is just a cabinet by itself, that gets us to 62 gigaflops per watt. And then the entire Frontier supercomputer is number two on, on that list. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And so these, these systems like, like Frontier, they, they don't stand alone. Uh, and to maximize efficiency, 
we need to be we need to think about how they're deployed and managed within the broader data center infrastructure. Um, and, and as important as efficient efficiency is is uptime for these systems, because if these mach if these machines go down at all, um, it can be very costly in terms of lost productivity. It takes a long time to bring the machines back up once they go down. So we've been working on a project with the, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Golden, Colorado called AI Ops. And, and what AI Ops seeks to do is apply um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to the stream of data coming from the compute facility in order to improve uptime and improve energy efficiency. And the reason this is challenging is that these exascale class systems like Frontier generate about 10 million data points per second. Think about that. I mean, these are big systems, but 10 million data points per second. So analyzing that data in real time and at speed uh, to gain insight is, is really the challenge here. That's the hard problem. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, but it's not just about the system. The system doesn't stand alone. It, it sits within a, a broader facility. And so what you're looking at here is the data center in Golden, Colorado uh, that was used to deploy and test AI ops. So this is a real data center. Um, the facility houses two different supercomputers at the front and rear of that, um, of that diagram. Both are HPE, both are pre-exascale machines, but they're all 100% liquid cooled using technology similar to what I described earlier. And then in the center of that facility are more conventional air cooled uh, machines. Um, we have sensors uh, distributed throughout the facility infrastructure that are generating data at about 3,800 uh, points per minute. So think of these as temperature, pressure, uh, sensors, power sensors within the, the power and cooling infrastructure, um, separate from the IT. And then the IT itself is generating data at about 1 million data points per minute. So not quite at that 10 million mark, but still uh, very impressive. And then there are about 75 devices in the facility, like pumps, valves, and air movers with adjustable set points uh, that we can use to impact overall energy consumption. So the overall goal of this work is, is aggregate data generated by the facility and IT infrastructure use analytics on top of that data to create insight, and then use that insight to optimize operations. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, the, the first instance of AI ops is targeting uptime through anomaly detection. And then future work is planned on uh, adding algorithms to improve energy efficiency, but results so far are, um, are quite good. We show that we can detect about 50% more hardware related anomalies and prevent 40% more high priority incidents uh, in the NREL data center than was previously done. And importantly, with no false positives because false positives in a system like this just uh, significantly reduce uh, the, the productivity and efficiency of, of use of the tool. Okay, and this is shipping uh, today. This is within our HPE uh, um, high performance uh, compute software, software stack. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. So we, we talked about, um, talked about uh, uh, the, the issues with removing heat. We talked about the data center and, um, and now kind of going back into the system, we've been spending time looking at photonics as a way to improve energy efficiency of the communication infrastructure in these systems. And we've been, we've been working on photonics within labs for about the past decade, uh, looking at ways to de-risk uh, design components, first of all, within that photonic circuit, and then, uh, and then de-risk um, those, uh, those devices like lasers, uh, modulators, waveguides, uh, and, and the like. And photonics provides several benefits that are kind of summarized in the middle of this slide. So it improves bandwidth density. So this is how much data we can move per second per unit of volume, spatial volume. Uh, it improves uh, the reach because photonic signals travel, travel farther than, than electrical signals uh, before they need boosting. The way I think about this is that light doesn't interfere with itself, but electrons do interfere with themselves. And so they, uh, they have to be boosted um, uh, more frequently than, um, than light signals do. And then it's, it's simply the most efficient way to move data. So um, the farther into the system and the closer to the chips we can apply photonics, kind of like liquid cooling in uh, heat transfer, uh, the more savings we, we realize. So there's some uh, analogous uh, uh, benefit here. Um, go to the next slide, please, Tiffany. Now in these, in these HPC systems, these supercomputers, about 30% of the total energy consumed is uh, in that communication fabric. And so the photo at the top shows a silicon photonics chip uh, integrated with a switch ASIC, which is that sort of dark black uh, uh, chip on top, 
um, that's uh, within a multi-chip module package. And this is something that we designed within labs. We've built it in our facility and then are also, have also tested it uh, in our facility. And the function of that device is to convert electrical signals exiting the switch to photonic signals, which then can be routed elsewhere in the system. And um, the diagram at the bottom is a cross-section of, of the chip at, at the top. So looking at that diagram, the switch ASIC is sitting, that's that gray box on the left and it's electrically connected to the photonic substrate uh, through that green PCA. So the signals travel through that green PCA up into the, um, the, uh, the photonic substrate. And the photonic circuits themselves are embedded in that dark blue silicon interposer. And that's where the lasers, the modulators, the other photonic devices are, are, uh, are deployed. And then that, 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 um, that gray uh, box uh, in the middle is another ASIC and it's used to drive the photonic circuits, uh, and which are then, uh, signals are then directed into the optical fiber. So energy efficiency can be improved with this kind of a, a system by an order of magnitude because the energy required to move the electrons over long distances is effectively eliminated. Um, and then, so photonics is great for efficiency, but the other thing that allows us to do is it, it unlocks the potential for new architecture. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So getting back to the end of Moore's law, um, we've been investigating a new architecture that we call internet of workflows um, that isn't limited by the bounds of traditional systems and that can make better use of hardware heterogeneity. So think different CPUs, different accelerators, different memory subsystems, different ways to deploy uh, workflows. And so Internet of Workflows uh, seeks to execute composite workflows on the most efficient resources available, whether they be high-end HPC systems, cloud systems, on-prem or, or edge devices. And optimally matching workflows to available resources has pretty clear performance benefits that, that allows us to potentially escape that Moore's Law uh, flattening. Um, but it also has sustainability benefits by reducing data movement, um, by improving resource utilization, and then through energy aware scheduling of, uh, of workflow components. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and I'm gonna dig into this a little bit we don't have time to go into a, a deep overview, but those red boxes that you see on this slide, uh, those are all components that make up pieces of this architecture, which is primarily a software architecture at this point. So I'll, I'll walk through this at, at high level. So as an example, consider a workflow that might be triggered from that edge device at the, at the bottom left. That workflow is then broken up into parts. So for those of you that, um, that know about serverless architecture, think, think of these parts as functions within a serverless architecture. And then these functions can be executed in a variety of locations based on the requirements of the function and uh, the suitability of, of the infrastructure for executing that function. Uh, the three modules at the top of this diagram are used to simplify application development and then uh, estimate various operational metrics for functions running on specific resources. So a simple example is the estimation of performance or, or energy consumption for a function running on a CPU or a GPU. Given the function, it might be better on the CPU versus the GPU. That's what we're trying to figure out here. And then the workload manager, which sits right below, uses the operational metrics from the modules above, and it determines the infrastructure on which to execute the functions. And then the scheduler down below schedules the functions on the appropriate local resources. And then communication across the functions, once they're running on the hardware in systems um, and running on separate resources, that communication is coordinated through uh, the accelerator communi communication architecture, which is the boxes down below. So I know that was kind of a lot, but in summary, what we're doing is that workflows launched, Workflow is then broken up into pieces. Those pieces are executed on the most optimal resources available. And then the pieces must communicate in order to achieve uh, the desired outcome. So that's kind of it in a, a nutshell. Let's go to the next slide. And then sort of, as I mentioned, you know, much of this thinking has been adopted from serverless computing architecture uh, used in the, in the public cloud uh, with, with the goal of making application development more productive, particularly in the HPC AI and uh, data analytics space, which is starting to converge. And so as an example of this, you know, the benchmarking framework up on top and performance prediction modules uh, can assist us in, in application development by estimating the impact that particular resources might have on performance and functionality. So they help make optimization decisions uh, when developing code and then programming for heterogeneity on the upper left abstracts complexity 
within the hardware where possible, uh, such that source code can be leveraged across different compute accelerators. And we're not developing unique source code for each type of accelerator that that code might want to run on. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And then sustainability, kind of similar to, to DevOps. You know, these modules on top uh, are used to estimate performance efficiency of functions uh, executed on particular resources, and the manager and the scheduler match functions to the most energy efficient resources possible. So th this whole project is in the fair, in, in the relatively early stages, and we're just starting to talk about it publicly. So if you're interested in learning more, or you know, if you're in the development community and uh, are interested in contributing, uh, please do reach out to us, and uh, and we'll have uh, deeper conversations with you. All right, let's go to the next one. Almost done, and then we'll pass it back. The Tiffany. Uh, so here I wanted to go through um, uh, really quickly some of the work we're doing with Carnegie Clean Energy on improving the operational efficiency and reliability of wave energy conversion conversion systems. So let's go to the next one and see if we can get the video to work. All right, it's working. Excellent. So the um, the the uh, the picture down below shows the size of the buoy with four people standing on it. So this is this is uh, at scale. And then um, the video shows the buoy in operation uh, in uh, in the ocean environment. Uh, and um, the um, the buoy converts energy to electricity via induction generators. Uh, Tiffany, you might have to hit it again. Oh, there it goes. Maybe it's my bandwidth issue. But um, it, con it converts energy to electricity, wave energy to electricity via induction generators in the legs that are tucked up underneath kind of where that leg, those cables meet the, um, the, the buoy. And the, the efficiency of the conversion is a function of buoy orientation and rotation. Uh, rotation wastes energy, so we'd like to minimize it. Uh, this system uses a baseline spring damper system in each leg, and we've replaced that with a reinforcement learning controller that, um, that can adjust the tension on those legs uh, to, uh, to, to uh, affect its orientation. The physics governing this system is really complex, and modeling it requires a supercomputer of the kind we discussed early, earlier. So instead, what we're doing is using reinforcement learning to model the behavior of the system through a neural network that can be initially trained using a physics-based simulation, and then that model can evolve over time through state data collected by the physical system when it's in operation, so motion, velocity, wave characteristics, and then uh, from feedback from the operational performance of the system. Uh, so the controller then manipulates the reactive forces on the induction generator and, um, and, uh, and, the, and, and then also using real-time state data and this evolving neural network model. Go to the next one and um, see if we can get those videos working. Yeah, I see it. So th this shows the isometric and top views uh, that compare the reinforcement learning controller to the spring damper controller. What you kind of note here, if you look closely, is that the twisting yaw is significantly reduced using the reinforcement learning controller. That increases energy conversion rate, but it also reduces overall stress on, on, on the legs. And so just an example of how we're using some uh, of uh, the, the IT, the technology that we're working on to affect other systems. And so for that, I'm gonna pass it back to Tiffany and we'll do a, um, spotlight on the uh, sustainability dashboard. Thank you, Colin. Um, phenomenal amount of detail. So many questions coming in through the chat. So I'm just going to preface by saying we're not going to get to all these questions, but um, I've pulled some from the Q&A and some from the chat, and we'll try to leave about 10 minutes at the end to, to start addressing some of them. So what I'll show you now, and there's additional materials that you can find online. So I'm not going to go too far into depth about this, but basically, you know, this whole presentation is about outlining the customer opportunity for us in addressing what will be required to reach net zero. Um, a lot of folks may have the misconception that there's sort of a silver bullet type thing that we can do in order to get to net zero, some great technology that's not been uncovered yet. Um, but the reality is that it's a multitude of many, many actions taken basically at every step of the value chain. So uh, HPE doing its part to research technologies to try to figure out how we can better enable sustainability, both from the sustainable IT perspective, but also from the IT for sustainability. And so 
the whole thing has been just outlining how addressing sustainability is an opportunity to drive innovation and really listening to our customers to understand their pressures, their struggles, and the opportunity that that creates. And so that's how we came up with the idea of the sustainability dashboard. Um, truth be told, one of the fun facts about innovation is that sometimes the timing is just not right. And so Cullen can tell you that he actually worked on a cloud sustainability dashboard 12 years ago, 15 years ago, <laughs> um, but way way ahead of its time. They were trying to figure out how to create net zero data centers back in the 2010 timeframe. Um, and so the market really wasn't ready for it yet. So this idea has been revived and really it's an iteration of a lot of research that a lot of people have done before. And this particular proof of concept is a cloud-based tool on the GreenLake Cloud platform that helps you baseline your IT energy usage and provides guidance for reducing that energy usage across your enterprise to help your organization achieve its sustainability goals. And HPE has a unique opportunity to unite this from edge to cloud. Um, so first we start with data, right? Data from our infrastructure, from our workloads that we have in our estate. Um, so in phase one, we take all this data and we showcase it in a dashboard which gives you the ability to use the data to have an accurate representation of what's going on. Uh, we know from our own net zero journey and from speaking with lots of our peers in other industries, but in on their sustainability teams, that one of the biggest issues with sustainability is we just don't have access to quality data. Um, and so the inputs are largely estimated or unknown, and therefore how can you plot a trajectory if you don't necessarily understand where you're at today? And so that's what we're aiming to achieve. Phase two then introduces other sources of data that can bring that in as well. So that's when we're thinking about things like real estate data, supply chain data, power source data. You know, what could we do if we were better connected to utility data real time? Google just put out a study um, within the last week that refreshed on the research that they were doing on the 24, uh, 24 by seven by 365 energy matching so that you can understand renewable energy by the hour of every day. You know, what happens when you start to unite all of these really powerful sources of data to then drive action? Um, and phase three gives us a way to correlate this data and provide a stronger layer of reporting back. So this is the idea of, you know, the savings and the corporate governance and the growth and really driving into this future. And this is where Cullen and I are also partnering um, on a much longer trajectory. But when you start to look at things like AI, ML, automation, performance, how can you start to take what are largely human de decisions at this point and start to layer in logic so that the system itself can be smarter, uh, so that folks don't have to go and make specific sustainability related decisions, but instead embed that as a logic that then is created just as a part of your broader workload management schema. So now I'm gonna give you a sneak peek of what this looks like and try to wrap it up in the next couple of minutes, but I see the chat going wild. I'm gonna ignore the chat for a minute. <laughs> so we start with a global view that basically if you're a global company and you have multiple sites around the world, it gives you the opportunity to orient to each of your sites. So you can see looking through a specific filter. So up here, you can filter on things like energy cost, carbon emissions, efficiency, and you can see uh, with your sites relative, you know, which has the best energy cost performance at this point. So we see that Edison um, is in the top quartile, Tokyo is in the bottom quartile. And so that leads me to then want to do more research to understand what is it that's driving Tokyo to have higher energy costs relative to the rest of my sites. And the same can be true for things like IT efficiency or carbon emissions. You can also see that there's your global IT energy usage per month in megawatt hours over here and your carbon footprint in megatons per month. And this is a CO2 equivalent. And so then you get to a KPI view. This is a site level KPI view where you can see things like energy efficiency, energy consumption, total energy costs, carbon emissions, and the utilization rate over time so that you can start to understand the behavior of your IT estate relative to these metrics that um, either pertain to cost like your total energy cost or your emissions, right? So if your company or your organization has goals that they're trying to drive carbon emissions down, you can start to understand where 
out of all of the sites that I have, do I need to be focusing first? And what, why might that be? So we can see here that energy consumption in Tokyo is high and therefore the energy cost and the carbon emissions are also gonna be high. Um, I might have it, yeah, I have it hidden, but there's another view where you can see a table format that outlines essentially what the price per kilowatt hour is in here and what the kilograms per ki of CO2E per kilowatt hour are as well. So you can start to decide or at least see if Tokyo's grid, for example, is more carbon intense than the grid in Paris or New York because of the energy mix that is there. And then you can drive down into what we call a machine level um, KPI view. And so this is where you can start to understand at the machine level, because a lot of us have visibility at the facility level. Um, and I like to use the analogy of a house because I feel like it's really helpful for folks to understand. But if I'm trying to drive energy usage down in my house, I have my bill that I get at the end of the month. And the bill is a lagging indicator because by the time I get the bill, my behavior has already happened. And if I'm trying to drive down, let's say for personal consumption, either driven by cost or I'm trying to hit some energy emissions uh, reductions, if I wanna drive that down 20%, I have no idea what to do. I can try turning off the lights. I can try maybe running my washing machine less or I'm plugging my refrigerator in the middle of the night. But if I run all these simultaneous experiments in the, in the energy consumption goes down, I don't know what I did that worked. And so you can think about, that was a very, <laughs> that was a very simplistic example, but if you think about an IT estate that perhaps has a thousand devices or collectively 10,000 devices, this gives you the opportunity to start asking those questions of, what is the energy efficiency versus the age of the machine? So are there any tech refresh opportunities? And what exactly would that look like for me? How, if I refresh the equipment, how much would the energy profile change? What's the utilization versus the total kilowatt hours? Because we know with compute machines, for example, the higher the utilization rate, the higher the power draw. And so we really want to start to understand of these machines, which of them aren't doing anything but still drawing power? And what's the sum total of those machines? Uh, so you can start to understand that it provides an inventory of opportunities for you to take action. And this is a machine level um, detail view. And so you can see there's things like utilization rate, age, um, temperature, power draw. And if you, this is a static version for internet control reasons, but um, if you scroll over, you can also see the carbon emissions and the individual energy draw per machine. And so just to summarize and recap and leave, I guess only seven minutes for question and answers, um, really what we're talking about, three main takeaways from today. So sustainability, particularly methods and technology to achieve net zero carbon emissions by mid-century are becoming key business drivers for our customers. Two, within sustainable IT, HPE has industry-leading solutions available today, and Hewlett-Packard Labs has a robust research pipeline related to sustainability. And three, HPE is building a sustainability dashboard, which we just showcased. Right now, it's a proof of concept. Um, there is no availability date uh, because it's still in proof of concept mode with the office of the CTO. Uh, and that's to allow our customers to uncover inefficiencies and prioritize actions from edge to cloud so that they can achieve their sustainability goals. All right, so now moving into the Q&A, I have not looked at the chat, so I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna miss all of these, but let's go down to some of the interesting ones. Colin, there were some, some for you. Um, I'm gonna take three questions and uh, turn them into one that was um, during the liquid cooling uh, portion when you were talking about the HPE Cray X4000, I think it was. Yes, so yep. what's the cooling wastewater classification after use? Um, so what can, I guess, what can we do with that cooling oh. mix of water, et cetera? Yeah. And then also what can we do for systems that aren't completely homogenous? So what do we do for the 99.9% .9 of the other gear out there? Yeah, and so the, the, um, that chilled water is water. And uh, if it's at high enough of a temperature, it, it can be used uh, to, um, to uh, you know, for for industrial uh, or commercial heating purposes. So what NREL does, they actually take that um, the uh, the hot water coming out of their systems, out of their data center, and they use it to heat up their buildings in, in the winter time, and they use it to dethaw 
uh, patios and, uh, and and the like, walkways and, and the like. So so they're actually using that, and then they're sending it back uh, into the uh, the data center to to um, to uh, to pull in more more heat. They're, they're also using systems that um, that don't waste water. So they're they're using what's called a thermosiphon when they can to to exhaust that hot air or that that heat from the the chilled water into the external environment without having to use cooling towers, which uh, is a, is a source of water usage. Um, and then for um, for systems that are that are non homogeneous that are not liquid cooled. Uh, there's a variety of, of things that, that we do. So, so we, we offer several different sorts of liquid-cooled solutions. I mean, one is um, a, a liquid-cooled heat exchanger attached to a rack. That brings facilities chilled water to the rack, and then, and then it cools the air before the air gets pulled into the systems. And so that way, conventional air-cooled systems can still take advantage of this cooling technology. And NREL does th the same thing, that those legacy systems that were in the middle of their, of their data center use, um, use conventional air cooling. Thank you, Colin. Um, so I just went through the chat box. There's a lot of questions around like HPE's footprint, HPE's use of renewable energy. For those types of questions, I would encourage you to go to the Living Progress report. So you can either just search on HPE Living Progress, or you can go to, I think it's www.hpe.com slash living progress. And all of those details about our sustainability performance, our footprint, the breakdown of our renewable energy, basically any metric you could want is listed in that report. And you can see the annual year over year trending. So I'd encourage folks to go there. Um, we also had a question around, uh, some of these are gonna take more than three minutes. Okay, um, let's go to the question around, um, how can I get more involved in this type of work or how can I better incorporate sustainability into my work. And so I'm gonna answer part of that. And then Colin, I think if you wanna talk about information about any of the topics discussed. So first there's a couple of things. Um, HPE just launched a climate training this year. Uh, it was mandatory for BPs and above, but I would encourage anybody who hasn't taken it yet um, to go ahead and take that training. It's a good introductory baseline for the types of things that you can be thinking about in your day-to-day -day work. Um, second for trainings, there is sales pro community, which is for pre-sales, sales and channels. So sorry, these are internal to HPE, not external. And there's also tech pro for pre-sales and channel where we will be launching additional sustainability trainings this year. Um, for those of you involved in R&D within HPE, we had a tech con sustainability challenge this year and last year. Um, and then externally, you can go to hpe.com slash sustainable IT, or like I said, visit our living progress report. So Colin, if they want to learn more about any of the topics that you discussed today, what would you encourage them to do? Most of those topics uh, have been um, published. So there are externally available publications. Um, you can you can ping me uh, and I can I can uh, send you a kind of a cross section depending on what you're interested in that the uh, the topic I shared around Internet of Workflows, like I said, is pretty new. We haven't published that yet. So you're getting kind of a, a, a preview of that work right now. But um, much of the code that we develop uh, when we work on projects like this is open sourced and it's on GitHub at some point. So again, if you're in the development community and you're interested in engaging on this again, send me a note and I'll put you in touch with the uh, the technical lead of uh, the project and uh, we're probably not ready right now to have code reviewed because we're still just beginning but this is a good time to let us know your interest all right and i think with that didier it's probably time to wrap it up thank you tiffany thank you Kellen. i think that was great thank you everyone for joining uh we have a poll up in uh, in front of you if you uh, can answer that those three simple questions that helps for uh, for building some additional content in this program. So thank you, everyone. I think uh, that was great. We will make the slides available as uh, some uh, on the Munch and Learn uh, webpage. We will also work on the replay so we can get this uh, in the coming week or so. And um, we thank you very much. And uh, we hope to get you again on our Munch and Learn next month. Thank you very much.